All right, uh, moving on then uh, with Toynbee's study of history uh, to continue with this chapter uh, in which he will discuss uh, the Islamic society and how it is uh, fused together by two separate societies, the Aaronic uh, Islamic society and the, uh, the uh, Arabic. And so, but before we get to that, I want to take a look at the chart in the back of his final revised version of a study of history, which he did himself in 1972 whereas the popular abridgment that everyone reads was done by D.C. Somerville in, in two volumes, and it's very good. Um, I recommend starting with that for anyone who wants to read Toynbee uh, and then not reading this final one-volume edition until after you've read that one. Um, so the diagram is quite a bit different. Uh, it has some similarities. Um, he divides civilizations here into full-blown civilizations, Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two are abortive civilizations. I like that, it's a good concept. He's gotten rid of the arrested civilizations, with, which I think was wise. And then he's added, so uh, he breaks down full-blown civilizations into A, independent civilizations, there's actually no such thing, and B, satellite civilizations, which is uh, a great idea. This is a new idea that he adds in at the end of his career here. So, uh, independent civilizations unrelated to others, the Middle American and the Andean, um, unaffiliated to others, the Sumero Akkadian. The problem with thinking of the Sumerians as unaffiliated to any other, it's not affiliated to any other high civilizations. It comes into being 3500 BC between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, but it is affiliated to the Neolithic societies that preceded it in that very same landscape the Samarans, the Ubaidians, the Halafians going all the way back through the Neolithic. And then the Egyptian civilization most certainly is uh, affiliated to the Sumerian civilization. Uh, Henry Frankfurt uh, was a guy who wrote a book back in the 1950s called The Birth of Civilization in the Near East, where he adduces all kinds of evidence connecting the Egyptians to the Sumerians, including uh, the birth of writing, uh, 3200 BC in the tomb of the Scorpion King. Uh, there are certain similarities between that writing that emerges on these carved ivory uh, slate pieces and uh, the writing system that the Sumerians came up with, uh, in addition to cylinder seals, the presence of cylinder seals in Egypt uh, through, clearly they were doing international trade. Um, and the Aegean civilization, by which I take, he, take that he means the Minoan thalassocracy, as he calls it. And the Minoans are a kind of satellite of the Egyptians uh, just as the Indus Valley civilization here uh, is a kind of satellite of the Sumero Akkadian, and the Indus Valley comes in 2600, as does the Minoans, and the Sinic civilization, which is um, the Chinese, the early Shang Dynasty Chinese. But that, in turn, and once again, we have the problem of affiliation to the Neolithic societies before it, the Yangshao farmers and the uh, Lungshan um, militarists who conquered them, um, affiliated to others, the Syriac, which we'll be talking about in this video. The Syriac is, uh, which originates in the uh, the coastal zone of the Eastern Mediterranean there, which includes the Canaanites, the Hebrews, um, and the various descendants of the Sea Peoples. Syriac to the sumero Akkadian, the Egyptiac, the Aegean, and the Hittite. That's very plausible. Hellenic to the Aegean, obviously to the Minoans. Um, the Indic to the Indus Valley peoples. And the African first... This is a new society here that he didn't have in the, uh, the the books that he wrote in the 30s and 40s and 50s. The Indic to the Indus, um, and the, the African rather is the new one. African first to the Egyptian, then to the Islamic. We can think of the Af African Meroitic society, which is copying the Egyptian tombs, and then affiliated to the Islamic, and then to the Western. Then we have uh, these three the Orthodox Christian, the Western Christian, and Islam affiliated to both the Syriac and the Hellenic, and we'll see in this video how the Islamic is affiliated to the Syriac, and then the satellite civilizations. Now we have here, he's taking into account more and more tribal societies, and so he has the Mississippian and Southwestern of Middle American. Uh, these are tribal societies, the North Andean and the South Andean of the Andean. The Elamites who are definitely a satellite of the sumero Akkadians and was one of their mortal enemies. Later, the Persians conquer them and wipe them out and set their capital of Susa uh, in, in Elam. Um, and the Hittites are also a satellite of the sumero Akkadian. That's definite. 
the Urartians. Um, the Iranians, uh, meaning by this the Achaemenid Empire, the Iranians first of the sumero Akkadian, then of the Syriac, um, and then of Egy the Egyptian, we have the Meroitic uh, of Egyptiac, the Korean and the Japanese of the, and the Vietnamian, this is a new one, he's added the Vietnamian of the Sinic, and the Italic, and then the Southeast Asian, which is first affiliated to the Indic, then in Indonesia and Malaya only of the Islamic. Then we have the Tibetan, which he ha he's also gotten rid of the fossils. Um, we'll go through those. He's gotten rid of the fossil societies, which had previously included the Tibetan Buddhists. Um, and the Russian, first of the Orthodox Christian and then of the Western. Uh, but see, we get into a problem here, and we'll get into this about his failure to grasp and understand Spengler's concept of the pseudomorphosis, because this second phase that he's referring to, which I take it uh, he's talking about uh, uh, Peter the Great and uh, the, con the construction of St. Petersburg on European models of architecture and arts and, and so forth, that's all a pseudomorphosis. That's not an affiliation. So his concept of affiliation is in many ways uh, his version, his equivalent of Spengler's concept of the pseudomorphosis when one culture's influence lies so heavily over the land that a newborn culture uh, has to uh, find itself at first through expressing itself through the form language of the previous society. And that's the same thing for anyone who understands art history. Every artist starts out by imitating mentors and the previous generation. Uh, Mark Rothko starts out by, uh, for pretty much the first 40 years of his life, imitating modernist iconotypes before he finally finds uh, his, his own art with the, the luminous uh, the luminous squares. Uh, it, it's just a common, the pseudomorphosis, is, it's a common idea. Um, and I think that one of Toynbee's weaknesses is his, he doesn't really understand culture that well. Art, culture, uh, not, not at all the way Sp Spangler understands it. Um, Southeast Asian of Indic, Tibetan, and the nomadic of sedentary civilizations adjacent to Eurasian and Afrasian steppes. Um, I wouldn't even consider the nomads a civilization. They don't, they're not a, a, a civilization. They're what Spangler calls an amoeba, a cultural amoeba. They're spread out over vast spaces and they are horizontal in their orientation and they prefer smooth space to striated space and they don't build vertically. Their, their whole way of life is based on maximizing mobility. And when you're maximizing that much mobility, there's no time to be sedentary enough to allow a, a time and space in which to grow and develop a, a civilization. And the abortive civilizations, uh, the first Syriac, is, which is eclipsed by the Egyptian, uh, the Nestorian Christian, which is eclipsed by the Islamic, the Monophysite Christian, eclipsed by the Islamic, the far Western Christian, which is the Irish uh, Christian, eclipsed by the Western, namely the Vikings, the Scandinavian, uh, eclipsed by the Western, uh, once they are converted to Christianity, and then medieval Western city-state cosmos, that's a new one here, uh, eclipsed by modern Western. Um, so this is the, uh, the diagram that he gives at the end of his life. All right, so now let's look at this chapter um, <clears throat> that uh, we continue with the Iranic and uh, Arabic societies. This is a map of the Achaemenid Empire, which exists from about... Uh, 500 to, 550 to 330 BC. And um, so this is the note, the territory that it covers here. Um, it goes into the uh, um, the Balkans a little bit. And then uh, Anatolia, uh, all of Syria over here and the coast down into Egypt and across through uh, over the Zagro Mesopotamia, over the Zagros Mountains into Persia. Uh, so it's a huge, huge empire. And so keep this in mind because this is a universal state. Last time what we saw was that uh, we looked at the two forms, he, and he starts in the West. Uh, so there's a method that he's following. He starts in the West with Western Christendom and Orthodox Christendom, and now he's moving into the Middle East with Islam. These are the extant, still living societies, um, and he's looking at the living ones, in a sequence that moves from west to east, because after we're done with Islam, he'll move to India, then China, then back to the fossil societies that are vestigial survivals of previous civilizations, 
and then back to the earlier uh, ex extinct uh, societies, keeping with the archaeological metaphor. And so, um, so he says. Uh, so last time, what we we saw was we saw that uh, the universal state of the Roman Empire had produced uh, first through the internal proletariat of the Christian Church, eventually a universal church, um, and then the external proletariat there of the barbarians with their folk or Vandurang, uh, and eventually integrated with the Christians to create Western Christendom and the revival of the ghost, what he calls the evocation of the ghost of the Roman Empire through the Holy Roman Empire. And um, so we need these three institutions of um, universal state, universal church, and a folk or Vandurang. And so he says, now with regard to the Islamic society, like the distinction between Western Christendom and Orthodox Christendom, two separate societies that are both affiliated to the same society, namely the, the Hellenic. Uh, with regard to Islam, we have a similar situation here because Islam really has this distinction between uh, Iranic, uh, Iranic uh, Islam, which is, of course, Shiite, and uh, Sunni Islam, which is, of course, Arabic. So we have an Arabic society and an Iranic society, and those two are fused together he says in 1516 A.D., when uh, Ismail Safavi uh, heads the revolution in Iran of the uh, the uprising of the Shia and absorbs uh, the two and heals that suture, so that from 1516 on we have had one single Islamic society that has been built up out of the suture of these two. Whereas in the West, this never happened. Western Christendom did not fuse together with Orthodox Christendom. They, they've always remained separate. Not the case with Islam, though. And so he says, okay, so we have a universal state, in this case, which will turn out to be the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, that is the universal state that appears for Islam. And, of course, the universal church is Islam itself. And then it'll turn out that the Fulker Vandurung will be the Mongolian nomads who came in uh, in the 13th century uh, um, from these regions out over here and came in and s just flooded everything and destroyed the Abbasid Caliphate. 1258 uh, pretty much just wipes it out with a Mongolian empire of barbarian nomads, basically the equivalent to the German barbarians uh, who come in and just and, and flood the whole thing. Now the problem is uh, there's some some... Brilliant stuff here, but there's also some awkwardness going on because Toynbee's thesis does not account for the Ottoman Empire. And indeed, in this early version of the text, with his concept of arrested civilizations, he thinks of the Ottomans as a kind of aberration. He calls them an arrested society and says that they were brutal and barbaric because they enslaved young boys. They went and captured young boys as slaves and turned them into uh, the core called the Janissaries, which were an elite core of warriors that were then sent into the Balkans to capture it and work on fighting for it. And he says that this is a barbaric society, really. It's, it, it devolved from uh, a human level down to an animalistic level in treating people like this. That may or may not be true, but he can't just sweep away the Ottoman Empire under the rug uh, because what it really is is what I think it, the Ottoman Empire is the universal state of Islam, not the Abbasid Caliphate. The Abbasid Caliphate, as anyone knows, who knows anything about Islamic history, is the flower of Islam. It is the great golden age that corresponds in our civilization to the Baroque and the time of the Enlightenment with Goethe, Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, all the classical music, the, the magnificent splendor that is the flower of the apogee of a civilization. That's what the Abbasid Caliphate is. It isn't the Caesar period. It's not the imperial period. So that doesn't work. That model just simply does not work because the Ottomans essentially have all the characteristics uh, that are very similar to a universal state like the Roman Empire. They're crude, barbaric. The Romans have their gladiatorial arenas. The the uh, Osmanlis, or the Ottomans as they're also known, they uh, have their Janissaries. And they also did not produce much in the way of art and culture, the Ottomans did. Uh, unlike the Arabs, on the one hand, who produce all the great philosophers of Islam, and the Iranian branch, uh, or zone as he calls it, on the other hand, produces all the mystics and, and great poets in this great period of Floreazon. The Ottomans did not produce anything but pragmatic men, engineers, doctors, uh, 
statesmen, military men. It's, it's all pragmatic, just like the Roman Empire, just like the Americans. So I think his model is wrong here. And I think that uh, there's a big problem. There's a lot of brilliant ideas in his handling of the Islamic society. Uh, but in a way, it's a kind of gigantic goof, I think. I think Spengler had it correct with his idea that this... Um, all these different societies, and he basically will talk about four of them here. The Syriac Society, which is apparented to the two affiliated societies of Iranian Islam on the one hand, and its zone, by the way, Iranian Islam has a horizontal zone. Last time we saw that uh, there was a central spinal backbone in the West uh, that was picked up from the periphery of the pre previous Hellenic Society, here, which was ver uh, vertical more or less, here it's horizontal. It goes through Anatolia, through Armenia, and across into Khorasan, and over here up into the Oxus and Jaxartes River Basin, and then down here. That's its horizontal band, its, its axis. And then it crosses a vertical band with the Syriac uh, Society here, which uh, gives birth to the affiliated Arabic Society, which is basically a vertical band going down here down in this direction, including Egypt, and going down to Mecca and Medina. Um, so we have these two axes. Once again, I do like his geometrical thinking with, with these axes. They work very well. So we do have two distinct culture zones here with the Iranian Islam and Arabic Islam. Um, but I don't think, the, I, I think Spengler, what Spengler had right was his idea of the Magian civilization comprises the Judeo-Christian Islamic societies, although it must be said that he gives a short shrift to the Jews and almost never mentions them, but um, and he pushes his pre-culture phase back to 500 BC. It should really be back to 1,000 with Solomon and David as part of the pre-culture phase. There may be some anti-Semitism in, in Spengler. I, I can't uh, say for sure, but there might be. He sort of overlooks them. And so the virtue of Toynbee's model with the Syriac society here that consists of the Hebrews, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Phoenicians, and the descendants of the Sea Peoples here, uh, who represent the prior Volker Vanderung, uh, the Sea Peoples coming probably out of the Black Sea region down through here, uh, destroying the Hittites, destroying all everything going on in, in Syria, Palestine, and also uh, the Egyptians barely survived and had to settle them in the coast. And at the same time, the Exodus is going on with the Hebrews coming up out of Egypt. Um, and that inaugurates, uh, that Fulker Vanderung inaugurates the Syrian, uh, Syriac, as he calls it, uh, society, which then is the parent of the Iranian on the one hand, whose center of axis has been displaced from the, the homeland of the Syrian, uh, just as the West's center of axis has been displaced from the homeland uh, of, of Hellas, of, of the Greek world, whereas the Orthodox Christian uh, society, the Byzantine world, includes that culture, includes that uh, cradle of origin within it. So too with the Syriac vis-a-vis -vis its child, the Arabic society, the, the uh, Arabic Islam, um, includes within its reach, when it conquers these areas, the, the cradle, the, the homeland. And so it's analogous to the Eastern Orthodox in that sense. So he's trying to stick with this model of starting with uh, current societies and then tracing them back to a single mother or, or parent uh, to which it is uh, apparented. So let's look at some maps here. Um, now, Alex uh, Greece's response, the West's response, we could say, to the invasions of Darius in the Achaemenid Empire uh, was to send Alexander forth out of Macedon and send him forth to conquer the entire world. So what Tonby points out in this chapter is that there is a west to east and an east to west pendulation that goes back and forth. And he portrays Alexander's invasions as a disruption that penetrates into the east and disrupts the Achaemenid Empire, which disintegrates. And there's a central, there's another one of his geometric axes, which goes with right in between here with Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates world, that becomes a central sort of almost like a Lotharingian corridor, which is fought over by the Shiite Islam over here, Sunni Islam over here, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, a similar oscillation to that between um, France and Germany, fighting over the Lotharingian corridor. And so Alexander shoves his way through all of this world, conquers it, and, here we, and after his death it splits up, as does Charlemagne's empire with his grandsons into three quadrants. Here after Charlemagne's death, 
His empire splits up into three quadrants. We have the Ptolemies in Egypt. We have the Seleucid monarchy inheriting most of the Middle East and uh, Persia. And then we have this little outpost here, the Antigonids uh, over here. You can already see the Parthians uh, here. Uh, and this is also Greek, the Greek Bactrian world. Alexander penetrates the furthest over here into the Hindu Kush uh, region and into the uh, Jaxartes and Oxus rivers. Um, so we have this uh, pendulation, and then we get the pendulation from east back to the west with the first Mithridatic War uh, in 90, just uh, just about, uh, let's see, what is it, 80, I think it's 89, the first Mithridatic War, 89 to 85, in which Mithridates of Pergamum went to war against Sulla, uh, the dictator in Rome at this time, and uh, he's from Pergamum, here's Pergamum, but this is his uh, this is his region, his his kingdom over here, which includes Colchis, where Jason encountered Medea in Greek myth, and um, so and this becomes a, a very dangerous situation for the Romans. They they weren't sure how they were going to fare against this guy. Uh, he was very very dangerous, and so it represents a pushback from this same horizontal axial zone of Iranian Islam, and here. Then the West then responds by sending Pompey in, in 63 BC to annex Syria as a Roman province. And here it is. He annexes the whole damn place as simply a Roman province. And at the same time, one of the members of the triumvirate, Crassus, then decides to go on a campaign against the Parthians, who are hovering over in this area in between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And he leaves on a campaign to conquer them and goes then goes through Zoikma and then Karai. Uh, we have the Battle of Karai in which they cut off his head and his son's head and send it back. And so we get the Parthian resistance to any further Hellenic incursions. Here is the Parthian Empire at its greatest extent. Um, they are kind of a, a Persian offshoot of master bowmen riding horses. Uh, very difficult to defeat. And then... Uh, after them comes the Sassanids uh, in, later on in 224 AD. So we have the Sassanids, which is the Persian restoration of the Zoroastrian religion and culture. 224 all the way down to 651, and they simply conquer the whole zone here. That was originally, we saw, in the Achaemenid Empire. Keep your eye on that because it's important. So the East pushes back against the West, and then, uh, then we get Islam. So Muhammad comes along. Uh, right around the year 600, and then uh, comes up out of the Syro-Arabian desert from Medina and Mecca, and then he dies in 632, which is when we get the first five of the caliphs, the first five caliphs that then uh, start conquering the whole zone here um, and, and start spreading out. The first five caliphs are Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, and Hassan. And then they are displaced, uh, overthrown by the Umayyads. And so we have the Umayyads here who come in and take over pretty much the same area as the Achaemenid Empire, if you'll notice, uh, also including Spain. And um, 661 to 750 CE, and then they enter, and their center, by the way, is Damascus. They build uh, the church, uh, the Dome of the Rock, rather, the, the Dome of the Rock, uh, in opposition to Mecca's Mecca has a sacred stone, so now we have a sacred stone. We've built a mosque over the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven. Um, but the ca so Toynbee says the, the problem with the Umayyads is that the, the capital was, was in Damascus, which is off center. When you consider the fact that he says, on the one hand, with their left hand, uh, they're conquering North Africa. And on the right hand, they're conquering the area that was owned by the Sassanids. Um, but to put a capital city, a, a base of all these operations in Damascus, is to put it off center. So there's there's an imbalance here, which makes ruling this entire domain a, a bit awkward. And so when the opposites come in, they conquer a, a little bit less of, of the territory. The Umayyads retain Spain, and it's a bit less... But the key thing is that they move the capital from Damascus to Baghdad. Uh, where's Baghdad? It's right there. Uh, and they build Baghdad uh, right around the year. Uh, it's in the 8th century, near, near the end of the 8th century. And they build it, uh, I believe, Al-Mansur is the one who founds it. 
And this is one of the great cultural centers of all time, art and culture, philosophy, culture of all kinds, astronomy, astrology, alchemy, algebra, you name it. This is not a decline. So Toynbee has confused himself with his concept of the universal state, which should be morphologically equivalent to Spengler's idea of the Caesar, the period of the Caesars when the culture is stiffening up and becoming extensive rather than metaphysically intensive. Tommy seems to have confused himself. He doesn't seem to quite understand that this is not a universal state, not by that definition. If you rub it up against Spengler's idea of an imperial phase with Caesars and a, a crude mentality, which corresponds perfectly with the Ottomans, uh, it, it doesn't work here. This is the flower of this uh, society. But the point that he wants to make and the reason that he says that the Abbasids represent the Islamic universal state is because uh, it's, it's the same, pretty much the same exact region as the Achaemenid Empire. They've completely reunified it, reclaimed it. And so he says what has happened here is that there has been, um, with Alexander and the Hellenic intrusion, there has been an intrusion of about a thousand years from 300 to 600. Uh, there's, there's been an intrusion of, of about a thousand years that has disrupted the Achaemenid universal state, which then was a universal state that has been continued uh, by the Abbasids. And then, uh, so now what happens is that, so so we'll need to go back and look at the, the Achaemenids. Uh, hold off on that, we'll get to it. The Seljuk Turks now come down from out of these regions over here. They're, they're the Eastern Turks. The Ottomans will be the Western Turks, uh, the Seljuk Rum. And uh, they come down and they completely flood the place uh, and they are the foreshadowing of the Ottoman Empire because they are they are Turkish um, and they speak Turkish, uh, but their culture is written with Persian. So they're using the Persian language to to write their texts, um, just as we used Latin to write our texts with for a, a very long time while we spoke the vernacular languages. And so they come down here, and they are actually sort of in a way a revenge against the Abbasids because. The, the Seljuk Turks began as Abbasid mercenaries that um, people like Harun al-Rashid, the, the leader in Baghdad, would hire, they would conscript them and pay them uh, to be soldiers in their army to fight for them. And then eventually they realized, actually, you need us more than we need you. And so they come down and the Abbasids do manage to survive the enclave. They, they manage to hang on to Baghdad. Um, but then come the Mongols. And I like this animated map, which shows where the Mongolian invasion comes from, and it spreads like a human tsunami in all directions. Uh, starts in 1258 is when they get here, and that's it for the Abbasid Caliphate. They, they are dead, done, and gone. Uh, their days are over. And so we get this sort of Mongolian empire, which corresponds, I think, nicely on Sp uh, Toynbee's model to an external proletariat, Volker Vanderung, of barbarians that come in and wipe out the Roman Empire. Similar thing here vis-a-vis -vis the opposite caliphate. But we have this vexing problem, this thorn in Toynbee's side of the Ottoman Empire. And here they are. So they have now expanded. Um, and the dates for the Ottoman Empire, the empire is founded by Osmanli I, 1299. They last all the way down to World War I. And they just keep expanding and growing until they've conquered the entire Anatolian Peninsula. And then they start sending their Janissary soldiers to take the Balkans the Balkan Peninsula, eventually conquering Constantinople, Constantinople in 1453 with the help of gunpowder. and uh, But then they also take the Arabic world here, the, the Mamluks um, in Egypt, they conquer them. Uh, but they come up against the Persians. They, they don't ever uh, manage to get power o over the over the ironic uh, society, I ironic, uh, what Toynbee calls ironica uh, Islam. Uh, under the Safavids, in 1516 is when he says that the Shia under Ismail Savavid have a major breakthrough. Uh, and they, he says they sort of digest Arabic Islam um, in the same way that what could have happened between Western Christendom and Orthodox Christendom is that Western Christendom, especially during the Fourth Crusade, could have done the same thing to Byzantium, uh, simply swallowed it up and digested it, but that never quite happened. Instead, actually, ironically, it'll be the Ottomans that do that to the Byzantines when they conquer Constantinople. But I, he says that they absorb 
the Arabic world, and that it's been one single Islamic society ever since. But nonetheless, the maps speak a different story. These are two different worlds here. We've got the Safavids over here, the Iranians over here, the Shia over here, and we've got the Sunni over here uh, in this world. Uh, the Turks up here, uh, the Arabics, the Arabic peoples over here. Uh, looks like there, there, there's a fundamental backbone, a spinal backbone, a Lotharangian corridor that never uh, was fully uh, sutured together, stitched together. And so um, this is the Ottoman Empire at its greatest extent, and it has completely absorbed Mamluk, uh, the Mamluks, um, most of North Africa, everything going on down uh, that's important in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and they've swallowed up Greece and Bulgaria, Serbia. Um, there it is. That's the Ottoman Empire at its height. And it lasts for six centuries. That is precisely what we would expect of a universal state. Um, so this is the thorn in, in, in his side that just doesn't fit his model. This is the Islamic universal state. These are the Islamic Caesars. They're very crude, barbaric. Um, they treat people like garbage. And they have engin engineers and doctors. They don't have philosophers and great poets. The, the Ottoman Empire never gave us that. Uh, so this is your Roman Empire here, not not the uh, not the Abbasids. Okay. So uh, then back one more loop backwards in time to the Achaemenids. Uh, so then going back to the Achaemenid Empire, he says, so this was an interrupted universal state, which was interrupted by Alexander's invasions. And the Achaemenid Empire then would have been produced, if it was a universal state, it would have been produced out of a time of troubles. <clears throat> and indeed, he says, uh, if we go back to the period of the Assyrians coming down from uh, the land in the north between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Assyrians coming down, conquering uh, Israel in 723, they conquer it and deport the populations. And they are so excessive and brutal that uh, they're eventually completely destroyed and wiped out. The Babylonians pretty much burn Nineveh to the ground. But then the Babylonians also come in and they take the southern kingdom, Judah, and also deport that population. Uh, so we have the Assyrians and we have the uh, Babylonians and we have the Persians who are then involved over here with the Medes. And they come out of this region. And so this is a period of contending states, a time of troubles that is resolved when the Achaemenids emerge victorious uh, under Cyrus, and they send the Jews back to their homeland and so forth. So it is preceded by a time of troubles. Um, and so the mother society then is his final point, is this Syriac society here, which goes all the way back to 1200 BC is when we get the Fulker Vandering of the Sea Peoples coming out of the Black Sea, coming around, wiping out the Hittites, who were also uh, an Indo-Aryan satellite of Mesopotamia in a way similar to the Persian Achaemenids, as also an Indo-Aryan satellite. Racially speaking, the, they are Indo-Aryan, uh, but culturally speaking, they, they continue Mesopotamian culture forms in many ways. Um, and then, so then we get the conquest and the empire and the attempt to absorb this tiny, juicy little piece of land here, the Balkan, uh, the Balkan Peninsula. Mmm, that looks yummy. Well, I guess again, you've, you've, we've got Greeks living there and these are tough motherfuckers. Uh, they aren't going to put up with it. And it's astonishing to imagine the gigantism of this empire. And this tiny little peninsula right here kicks its motherfucking ass. I think that's amazing. I think that's that's one of the greatest boundary acts, I think, that has ever occurred when one culture has defined itself against another in a fierce act of defiance. And not only that, didn't just defend itself, but then sent Alexander over to conquer them. <laughs> Toynbee says, in this chapter, I mean, he portrays the East here as the victim, uh, but they started the aggression, not the Greeks. So, all right, uh, we'll end there for that.